I'm going to turn it over to Patrick Dan in a minute or two here. Uh, he's going to lead us through today's discussion. But um, I wanted to point out that uh, a lot of you might remember we used to have an annual meeting. I think it was called the Systems Operations Advisory Group back when. And we had that for a long time. And it got to a point where it seemed to not be useful to folks. It seemed to not be helpful to the audience. And it seemed like we were saying the same things that we were saying other places over and over again. So we stopped having them. And that was on me. That was my call. So I'll take responsibility for that. But um, in the recent discussions, the last year or so, and particularly through the Excess Water Task Force and some of those discussions, um, we have recognized the need to kind of reinvigorate that process and to, to have these kind of meetings where we can share information with our water users. So the one thing that I'd ask you to do today is, you know, obviously to listen to, to the information that's presented and ask wh whatever questions you might have in the process. But more than that, think about what information you need from us to, um, to do your jobs better or so that we can do our jobs better by providing you that information. And let us know at the end of the day, here's the things we didn't hear about. Here's the things that we need to know that um, uh, would really help us so that we can make these meetings better in the future. Because um, I don't know about you, but I hate to have meetings that aren't useful. Um, I hate to have meetings that feel like a waste of time. So we definitely do not want this meeting to be that kind of meeting. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick. And as I said, feel free to be as interactive as you want to and can be in this meeting, ask questions. Um, he's, all these guys are good at taking questions. And then um, let us know at the end of the day the other stuff that um, you'd like to know that you didn't hear today. Patrick. Thank you, Tom. So just again, I'll, I'll echo what Tom said, just because that's where I plan on starting. We're, we're doing this today. We've, we've prepared an agenda that we think kind of captures some of what we did historically, but also speaks to uh, some of the water supply questions that came up in the Excess Water Task Force. Um, so uh, just to cover the, uh, to go over real quick what we're going to talk about, I'm going to give a little, some, some operation stuff, but also we've got some water supply stuff that Chuck's going to talk about in terms of the 24-month study. Um, I think on the agenda today, in addition to what I'm going to share coming out of our operations group and what Chuck's going to share, um, we've asked uh, Phil Pagels to talk about the Salt River Siphon, which is going to be a big impact uh, in 2019, as, uh, as we'll be taking really the whole southern end of the, of the system offline for a six-week period. Phil's going to share some information about that. Scott's going to talk a little bit about what we've seen from a water quality and biology perspective uh, this year. Um, both of those guys have way better pictures in their presentations than I have in mine. I think they're, they're interesting, um, and hopefully they'll be on point with, uh, with uh, things we can learn about the CAP system today. Uh, and then Marcus is going to take some time at the end uh, uh, to walk through our, our water delivery reports and some changes we're, we're thinking about making. Kind of roll those out for the kind of day. That's a debut item. That's why we put it at the end. So we'll hope we'll, we'll stay for that. I think that's going to be hopefully interesting and helpful. So those are the things we're going to hit on today. Um, we created the, the times well before we actually prepared the material. So those are guidelines at this point. We're not really going to stick to those. Um, and as Tom indicated, we're, we're a reasonably sized group. If you want to you know, raise your hand and interrupt me and ask specific questions, we're glad to Glad to respond to those and, and, and follow up directly here today. So um, with that said, just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Restrooms are out that door and, and, and right around the, in that hallway out there. And I think Melinda um, uh, put some snacks, water and some snacks out in the hall, which you're, which you're of course, welcome to. Um, before I launch in, I did want to recognize a, a couple of people in the room. Um, just in case you don't know these guys, this is Phil Pagels. He's a project manager in our engineering group. As I mentioned, he's going to talk a little bit about Salt River Siphon. Um, Scott Bryan, who is CAP's uh, biologist, he'll be presenting to us today. Uh, Marcus Shapiro is on my team uh, in water operations. Um, sometimes I think in our water operations group, you hear our voices and get our emails but never see our faces. So that's Marcus. 
Um, I believe Melinda is, if Melinda can step in and wave real quick, this is Melinda Whittington. Uh, she receives your letters and your water schedules and you talk to her quite a bit on the phone. Uh, sitting next to Chuck over there, who is, who is infamous and needs no introduction, um, is John, <laughs> is John Husson, who's our, our water, water control supervisor and works with the real time guys in, in the control room. And then uh, Brian Bazard is our director of, of maintenance. I'm glad he's here today in case we have uh, other things about maintenance we want to talk about. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch in a number of the slides that I have in my uh, presentation. I put in there for reference. We're going to post the presentations on the website after the meeting. So there's tables and numbers and stuff. I'm not going to go through a lot of those other than speak to them generally, but they'll be available for you to look at uh, some of the more detailed uh, water supply type things that we have available. So just a, a couple of things from this year I want to hit on. Um, Alamo releases we had uh, back in March. Uh, the Corps of Engineers uh, had a pulse flow out of Alamo Dam that had a, a fairly significant impact on our operation, both in terms of uh, water quality impacts that we avoided by shutting down our pumping at Havasu. But uh, for the duration of that shutdown, there was about 40,000 acre feet of water we didn't pump. We've been trying to find other times in the year to make that back up. We got about 7,000 of it done uh, heading into the outage in June, uh, but the rest of it's going to follow at the end of this year. Uh, Scott's got some, I'm not going to talk anymore about it because Scott's got some information about that as well. Uh, Ascend Valley high voltage uh, transmission project. There's a new switchyard and transmission line project that we've been working with APS for a, a number of years on. Um, and it's finally kind of hitting its final phases of construction. Uh, right now, uh, the entire west end of the, of the CAP system is essentially offline, and it's because the, the Hacienda pumping plant isn't currently energized. Uh, so there's no pumping there. There's not even plant power there at the moment as they're doing the final switching and tie-in uh, for this transmission project. That's supposed to finish up on Monday-ish. Um, but it's not a week from Monday-ish, from what I'm hearing. They're, they're going to use all of the time they have allotted to do the project. It is a lot of work. It seems like it's mostly on track. They have had a couple of monsoons blow through on them and, and some different things that make the work challenging. Um, but they, uh, they're, they're shooting to be back online, so our pumping plant's back online at the first of next week. It'll take us a day or two. to. We're doing some other work at the same time. Um, some canal drawdowns and a siphon out of service. It'll take us a day or two to get up online, but uh, hopefully we'll start pumping in earnest from the Colorado River uh, towards the end of next week. Um, summer capacity constraints. For those in the room, we have had some, some peak deliveries. We've had kind of two main blocks of time where we have had some curtailments on the CAP system to uh, some of the ag districts. Um, those, are, those are always challenging because you know, it's, we take the water away at the time you need it, um, need it the most. But I did want to uh, thank a few folks in the rooms. SRP uh, helped us with some flexibility on the deliveries in their system to create some additional capacity so we can make water available to others. Uh, Tucson Water did as well, uh, shifting some of their recharge deliveries. And I, and I won't forget the City of Phoenix either. And City of Phoenix um, moved a little bit of water from their Union Hills plant to the to the Lake Pleasant plant so that we could uh, get a little more capacity through the New River Siphon, and that helped us out as well. Uh, in, addition, in addition to Marcus, who managed our own recharge facilities to try and uh, make water available to folks who are taking direct delivery and, and growing some crops to provide as much uh, capacity as we could. Um, so a lot of folks uh, helped in that effort. Um, some curtailments still happen, but uh, hopefully we're past that, even though there's still a lot of water coming out of Lake Pleasant at the moment. Uh, biology happens. Um, there's been a lot of exciting stuff. Scott's going to talk about that this year, both in terms of affecting some of our capacity at different times in the system, but certainly some water quality impacts. Uh, there are uh, a number of locations uh, within the... Uh, we've got some feedback from some of the treatment plants specifically that the amount of algae and things that we've seen in the canal have been problematic this year. And then just touch on a couple of maintenance efforts, certainly not the, the global focus of what we've, what we've done, but uh, the Agua Fria siphon, which is, is located uh, in Peoria, just a little west of uh, Lake Pleasant Parkway and 99th Avenue. Uh, it goes from the Agua Fria Tunnel on the west side of the Agua Fria River um, over to the CAP system on the east side of the Agua Fria River. 
Um, because the Hacienpa plant was out and there was really no water coming from the west end, uh, we took advantage uh, of that outage to get in and inspect the coating on that siphon. Both the Agua Fria siphon and the Salt River siphon are, were replacement siphons in the, in the late 90s and they're, they're steel structures and so they have a coating. And so that's really what the inspection is about, is getting in there to look at that coating for um, kind of the maintenance of that asset. And then Phil's gonna talk about the Salt River siphon. Um, real quick, this is kind of what uh, deliveries have looked like um, for this year. Um, some of the interesting things, uh, we had real strong demand here in uh, late April, early May. Um, that affected our lake fill just a little bit as well. So water that we thought might be going into the lake to top it up a little bit uh, actually went to customers. Uh, and then likewise, we had these, these spikes here in the summer, which uh, resulted in some, some of the curtailments that I, I talked about. Um, just a summary of water deliveries to date. This is a chart that we've been including in our in our board updates and briefs, thought we'd include it in the presentation, but it just uh, kind of shows we're, we're targeting about 1.5 million acre feet for total deliveries this year, uh, and we're, we're more than halfway there uh, through the end of July. Um, our Colorado River diversions. Um, for me, this graph is a little bit of tea leaves, and, and I, I don't mind reading through it because it tells quite a story, but. Uh, these, uh, these, the, the blue line represents the, the daily pumping that occurred uh, at, the, at the Colorado River. Um, and so the, the holes in the graph, I think, are, are some of the interesting ones. So here and here and these little dips here were all uh, temporary shutdowns that we did to facilitate the Sun Valley Transmission Project. So the project's been going for a couple of years. They were doing different switching as they phased in different parts of the new substation and within our own pumping plant we had to have some temporary outages um, as we went along to facilitate uh, their construction work to really get ready for this August outage that we're currently in. Um, this, this larger dip right here in the middle is uh, our shutdown for the Alamo Dam releases that occurred uh, there towards the end of March. Um, going towards the end of the year, as soon as we get back online here, we're, we're gonna pump. Um, we're gonna jump up to 25, 2800 CFS average um, our original plan was the orange line. Um, our modified plan is gonna be slightly higher than that to make up for some of those deliveries that we missed out um, earlier in the year. So, any questions about our, the, the diversion? Great. Um, this is just kind of a numeric representation of the, the graph we said, or, or of the graph I just showed. Again, uh, what we're thinking for pumping in terms of monthly volumes right now be included in the materials. Again, a, a five-year look, uh, kind of where we're sitting from, a, from Arizona in total. So uh, the bottom down here is uh, the, the on-river, higher priority Colorado River users, um, kind of where they're looking for over the last five-year time frame, uh, what we've pumped within the CAP system. And then of course, there's been some conservation projects over the last few years. And this is what we're kind of looking like uh, in 2018, is uh, similar to 2015 and 2016 at about uh, 200,000 acre feet total um, for, for 2014 through 2018. Um, there's a number of different, um, uh, on our website, we have a numerical breakdown of this for over the five years. Here's a graphical representation for your, for your reference. Uh, and then a specific um, breakdown of what we're looking at for specifically 2018 for this year. Again, the total is about 181,000 acre feet. A um, couple thoughts on, on Lake Pleasant. Um, I've already touched on the main factors, which were you know, uh, some higher demand earlier in the year. Uh, we actually did release in March uh, for the Alamo, Alamo uh, Dam releases to, for, uh, to meet some water quality objectives. Uh, and then we've had some high summer demand. So certainly the lake is, is headed uh, lower uh, than we had planned at the beginning of the year. Uh, we still think six, not only is 1633 a pretty good number, if, if the plant comes, if Hacienpa comes back at the first to next week, uh, we might be a little bit above that. Um, but the lake right now is dropping at three quarters of a foot a day or a foot a day, so um, it's, it's headed down pretty rapidly until we get the west end back in service. Again, we'll, we'll make up that pumping later in the year and, and hopefully by the time we close out the year, it'll be right back about the same location as where we where we planned at the beginning of the year. So, um, I included this one for reference. Um, 
people have asked me from time to time, how much water do you get in off the Agua Fria? And it does depend, it's all over the place. So uh, in 93 and first fill, we got half a million acre feet. Um, and that hasn't really happened since then. We've had a couple of big years, 05, 2010, and then last, in 2017, uh, there was fairly good uh, winter flow. But again, folks can have that, that information reference. We keep that updated. We usually share this. Uh, we include it in the materials for this meeting and have done historically. We also include it in our water quality report um, as well. Uh, this is what we're calling the, the blue table. Um, this was a, a product of the Excess Water Task Force uh, to try and um, provide some more detail about the, the total CAP supply, uh, where it was going, how much was available from the river. Uh, we've updated this uh, from the presentations that we gave in the Excess Water Task Force at the end of 2017, meaning we've kind of included the final numbers for 2017 in this and then added uh, the 2018 AOP and, and where we're looking to date. Um, so you can go back and look at this. I, I did want to talk, um, we've kind of blown this out and the, the numbers may be hard to read on the screen and not really important right now. I did want to talk real briefly about the <clears throat> estimated CAP Colorado River water available, or this final decree accounting number. If I can get my mouse to look on that. Um, the final decree accounting, um, this line in the sheet represents kind of what the, after, after all the uses have occurred, and Reclamation has done all the accounting on the river, if we were to go back and determine what the CAP supply uh, would have been. Um, as if, you, if you're not familiar, the, the CAP uh, water supply, the CAP's contract is an unquantified contract. It's a, a priority for entitlement that is available to CAP after the higher priority users have been uh, satisfied. Um, in truth, we don't know that the higher priority users have been satisfied until the accounting is all done at the end of the year after we've completed our water delivery season. Uh, but we do go back and, and determine that accounting and, and, and get an idea of what the cap supply was. I think it's important to point out that reclamation doesn't actually calculate that number that we've shown in the table. That's a calculation that CAP does. Reclamation in the accounting is actually accounting uh, consumptive uses by measuring diversions, uh, return flows, um, and then the ultimate consumptive use by all of the contractors. For CAP, they, for CAP, it's our, our diversion is our, our consumptive use on the river. So in the footnotes, we explain how we make that calculation. The data that we use does come from the final decree accounting, but essentially it's the other users, less 2.8, less any inadvertent overrun and payback, and some other conservation things in the calculation. But I thought it'd be good just to point out that it's, it's a calculated value, and CAP makes that calculation. But it's important to get a good idea of what the available CAP water supply is. So this will be in the materials, and you can look at that, and I'm glad to answer questions on it as well. Any questions on it right now? Just so curious. Great. Um, likewise, we um, provided some information on turnback. Turnback is, uh, this is turnback within the CAP system. So uh, our definition of turnback is if you scheduled your water in October, um, and we, we, we created a, both a water delivery and a financial schedule for you, and the year went by and you decided you didn't need that water, and you called us and wanted to, to turn it back to us to see if we could find another, another customer. Um, so it's a, it's a turn back of water that was scheduled but not delivered. Um, and we prepared this for the Excess Water Task Force. Has a few different categories, um, and I'll walk through those real quick so we can understand them. But uh, a successful turn back or a successful remarket means you schedule water, and you decided you didn't want it, you called us, and we were able to get it um, to, uh, to another water user. Generally, it's um, to the excess pool, uh, to the Arizona Water Bank or the GRD. Um, and we were able to move that water off your schedule. Uh, an unsuccessful remarket means you called us and asked us to do that, but we couldn't. There wasn't another place for us to move the water. Um, and then a scheduled and not delivered means uh, a water user would have scheduled the water, um, <clears throat> never called us, and the year came and went, and that water just didn't end up getting delivered um, um, under, their, under their contract. So, um, so that's kind of a summary of what that intra-year change from schedule to actually delivery is. Uh, we've updated that with the 2017 numbers, and again, that'll be available for reference. So, Yeah. Just stays in the 
It stays in Lake Pleasant, yep. It was diverted from the river. We planned on diverting it. We planned on delivering it. And so, yeah, it's, it, it ends up uh, retained in Lake Pleasant. Great question. Okay. Chuck. All right, good morning. My name's Chuck Cullum. I'm Colorado River's program, Colorado River Programs Manager for Central Arizona Project, and I'll be talking about the Colorado River water supply today. Um, first, thanks to Patrick, Tom, and uh, the operations team uh, for letting me talk about water supply. It's kind of what I like to do. So thanks for that and for uh, being patient with the slides arriving early this morning. So I do appreciate that. I'd like to say that it was because of all the breaking news about the water supply, but you know that's not true. So let's uh, talk about what we're gonna talk about. Uh, I'm going to provide a summary of the 2018 inflow to Lake Powell. Breaking news, it was a dry year. Um, uh, in order to, to fully uh, uh, explain the results of the August 24 month study, I think it would be helpful to reground ourselves in how the 07 guidelines operate, the coordination between Lake Powell and Lake Mead, and how that influences the water supply. Uh, determination for the lower basin. And then I'll talk about the nitty gritty about what the August 24 month study uh, tells us about 2019 and 2020. So how dry was it and where was it dry? Um, the values that you see uh, on, the t on the screen are the April through the end of July unregulated inflow to Lake Powell. And the average uh, for that period, April through July, is about 7.2 million acre feet of unregulated inflow. In 2018, it, was, uh, it, is, it has been observed to be 2.8 million acre feet, or 36% of the 30 year average. This is inflow from three major river systems the Green, the uh, Upper Colorado, and the San Juan. And for this year, some interesting things were observed. One is that Historically, the Green River provides about a third of the inflow to Lake Powell. So the green headwaters are in the, the wind, the Wind River Range in Wyoming, coming down, capturing a little bit of the Uintas in Utah, and then the confluence with the Colorado. Um, the upper Colorado is the Yampa, the white, the blue, and then the San Juan is in the Four Corners region, Telluride, Durango area. In 2018, the green provided more than half of the inflow into Lake Powell. Um, there was a, a high pressure ridge that sort of camped out and blocked uh, winter storm uh, events from making it into the upper Colorado River headwaters here. Uh, normally, the upper Colorado provides about 55% of the inflow into Lake Powell. This year, it's about 45%. That high pressure ridge also blocked flow into the San Juans, which the San Juan system, which usually provide about 12, 13% of unregulated inflow into the system into Lake Powell. This year, it was about 5%. So we saw some, some meteorological uh, uh, shifts that manifested themselves into major changes in how the water made it to Lake Powell. In summary, Wyoming was a significant provider of water into Lake Powell. Colorado um, not really uh, performing very well. I'd like to talk to our colleagues in Cal Colorado about that. I don't know what they were doing, but it wasn't providing inflow. And the San Juan was really dry. So let's remind ourselves a little bit about how the guidelines work. Um, it's the coordination of the operations of Lake Powell and the operations of Lake Mead. So the, the coordination is, is about maintaining relative balance between the contents of Powell and Mead. The balance is uh, uh, those decisions about how much to release from Powell how much to release from meat are influenced by inflows, the releases, relative storage, and the whole paradigm, the whole system is designed to rise and fall together. 
One of the things with these large reservoirs is they develop momentum. And by what, what I mean by that is when we have dry patches in the hydrology and we have depressed store it, depressed inflows, it persists from one reservoir to the next. Um, so when we have a dry inflow into Lake Powell, it will eventually cascade as a depressed, it could eventually cascade as a depressed release from Lake Powell into Lake Mead, which will cause Lake Mead to decline. So uh, in the 07 guidelines, it's manifest as um, the, operation, the release decisions for Powell and the operating conditions for Mead. So since 2007, we've had two equalization years. That means Powell released significantly more than 8.23 million acre feet because the storage in Lake Powell was uh, significantly greater than the storage in Lake Mead. We've had, uh, I think about uh, eight upper elevation balancing releases and these are where we get between 8.23 and 9 million acre feet um, released from Powell to Mead, depending on the relative elevations, the relative storage between Lake Powell and Lake Mead. Um, this is the, the region where we have the so-called April adjustment, where we're in an upper elevation balancing tier. If the conditions in, in Lake Mead and Lake Powell meet a specific test, rather than getting 8.23, the minimum objective release. Um, if my upper basin colleagues are watching or will watch the tape, the obligation of the upper basin to deliver 8.23 million acre feet pursuant to the compact. They don't like obligation, but that's okay. Um, 8.23 to nine, if Lake Powell is below, projected to be below elevation 3575, then we have the mid elevation release tier. This is a, a, a rigid area of operations where if, we, if the secretary declares that we're in mid-elevation release, regardless of the incoming hydrology, we will get a 7.48 million acre foot release from Lake Powell to Lake Mead. As, as, as you all have heard us discuss and you all have discussed yourselves about the structural deficit and how we operate at a, de at a deficit even when we consider an 8.23 release, when you actually curtail that release by another 800,000 acre feet, 8.23 down to 7.48, the impact to Lake Mead is pretty dramatic. We would expect a reduction in Mead storage, Mead elevation by about 20 feet when those occur. We've had one mid-elevation mid uh, release, which I think was in 20, 12? Yeah. 12 or 13. For hydrologists, that's a, an acceptable range to be within a year or two. Um, on the Mead side of the equation, so, so let me just uh, uh, restate that. The release from Powell will describe how Mead operates. So far, we have always operated in the normal or ICS surplus condition in Lake Mead. Um, if we fall below elevation 1075 or are projected to fall below uh, elevation 1075 in the August 24 month study projected the end of the year, then we will be in a shortage condition. Uh, we are not in a shortage condition for 2019. So let's talk about the August 24 month study results. They were released by reclamation on August 15th. They rely on the inflow projections provided by the uh, Colorado Basin River Forecast Center in Salt Lake City. Uh, Salt Lake City is in the Great Basin, so it's sort of a neutral site. It's neither upper basin nor lower basin. So we think they're like Switzerland. They don't have skin in the game. And it's the um, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. So it's NOAA. Um, and they're just forecasting what the inflows to the system would be for the remainder of 2019 and 2020. So the projections show no shortage for 2019 and a significant risk of shortage for 2020. That risk is driven principally by 
um, a high a reasonably high probability for a mid-elevation release tier for Lake Powell. That is, the curtailed release of 7.48 million acre feet in water year 2020. That's October of 2019 through September of 2020. And what happens is when you trigger a 748 release, the last three months of the year, October, November, December, have a depressed release from Powell to Mead, which causes Mead um, in the model to fall below elevation 1070, or 1075. So why are they forecasting a, cur a uh, curtailed release, that 748, for water year 2020? Um, one of the things that the Forecast Center relies on is um, trendology. Yeah, I said trendology, which means dry years beget dry years, wet years beget wet years. So when we see a dry year in the, in, when we observe a dry year, we uh, expect it to be followed by a dry year until we hit a wet patch. Okay. So what does the forecast show for Lake Powell? Um, the forecast provides three outcomes in August. Um, a most probable, which is the, the median or 50th percentile inflow forecast, uh, 90th percentile and 10th percentile. For Lake Powell, what we see is the median forecast. Um, we uh, trigger a 748 release uh, for the minimum. We trigger an 823 in water year 19, followed by a 748 in 20 um, because of a, a very uh, a dry inflow sequence. And then the, the wet sequence um, gets up close to equalization. We don't need to spend time on the wet patch. So how does that perform for Lake Mead? Um, about as expected, the median outcome where we have uh, the rest of this year is a 9 million acre foot release. For water year 2019, we have a 9 million acre foot release. And then the last three months, of uh, October, November, December, because we're triggering a 748 rather than uh, creeping up past and above the shortage trigger, we end the year at elevation 1070 in the most probable projection. The minimum uh, where we have an 823 release followed by a 748, we drop uh, 20 plus feet out of the lake and end at 1057. And in what is essentially a normal uh, release, 9 million followed by 9 million, we end the year at 1079. So how frequent are these dry pairs? Um, in the th most recent 30-year record, uh, they are very frequent this century. Five out of the six uh, occurrences occur since 2000. And they are dry pairs. So um, when you remember that the average water year unregulated inflow to Lake Powell is about 10.8 million acre feet. Two years where it is the, essentially the average of one normal year. So these are really uh, dry sequences and they um, serve to push Lake Powell's elevation down trigger a uh, curtailed release and drive Lake Mead's elevation down. As I said previously, there's momentum in these reservoirs. When you ha hit these dry patches, it cascades from Powell into Mead. It usually takes a year or two. So how does 2018 compare if it is indeed the, the beginning of a, tri of a dry couplet? Um, it's more like 2012 than any other year, and 2012 uh, was followed by 2013, which was about 5.3 million acre feet. So there is a significant risk of uh, a dry year in 2019. So will 2019 bring a shortage for 2020? That's the significant question. Uh, the forecast is really right on the margin for triggering that 748 release. Uh, when you sort of look behind the curtain of the August study, you see that 
um, the trigger for moving from a 9 million acre foot release, that upper elevation balancing tier, to the 748 release. So what is that? You guys are smart, like one and a half million acre foot swing. Um, is 110,000 acre feet of inflow into Powell. The forecast was right on the cusp of either being a nine or a 748. It fell on the 748 side by 110,000 acre feet or about a foot and a third in Lake Powell. Uh, we tend to hover around these trigger elevations in the reservoir. I don't know how they know. Um, so if the inflows to Lake Powell are greater than about 75% of the 30-year average, then we have a, a decent chance of avoiding that 748 release. Another way to say that is if we have near normal or above normal hydrology plus continuation of the contributions we've been making to Lake Mead, uh, we can likely avoid um, shortage in 2020. But if we get below normal hydrology and we trigger that 748, it's, um, we will likely have a shortage even with the continuation of DCP-like contributions. The, as you remember from the, um, the August study results, the most probable, we ended at elevation 1070. That's five feet below the shortage trigger. That's more than um, 400,000 acre feet. The DCP contributions are about 200,000 acre feet. So it would be an enormous lift to avoid um, a shortage for 2020 if we don't have favorable hydrology. Do we have any indicators that give us any guidance on what the um, future hydrology pre winter precipitation pattern for 2019 will be. There's always the El Nino model, which is a cloud of different uh, models. And the green line is the consensus outcome for the winter season, which is circled here, is an El Nino, uh, positive El Nino signal of somewhere between ha uh, uh, half and one, which means a moderate El Nino. But El Nino is not a very skilled indicator of upper basin precipitation. It's reasonably skilled for Southern California in the Four Corners. So perhaps it, it might uh, signal a wetter San Juan system. But the San Juan, on average, only provides about 12% of the inflow to, the color, to Lake Powell. So does nature give us any signals? Well. If your horses in the upper basin suddenly become furry, I'm told <laughs> that means a harsh winter is coming. I was in the upper basin this weekend. I did not see this horse, but I'm on the lookout. <laughs> there are also stories of squirrels uh, hoarding acorns early, uh, like in August and September, or a and a bumper crop of acorns. I was in the upper basin this weekend and I did see lots of acorns. So perhaps that's a signal. I don't know. So I'll leave you with this. Keep calm, do a snow dance. That's all we have. Thank you. Questions? Yes, ma'am. So the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, did everybody hear the question? No. Okay. So do we monitor the sediment accumulation in Lake Powell and Lake Mead when we consider the elevations um, relative to these uh, determinations of operating release tiers or um, operating tiers in Lake Mead and Lake Powell? So Reclamation updates the, uh, conducts a sediment survey uh, about every decade in Lake Powell and Lake Mead, and then they update the um, area capacity curve based on the, the, uh, obs the change in storage. The last one was 2010? It seems, yeah, it seems pretty frequent. They, not only do they do the sediment survey, they do it just like Chuck said. So they get, they get the sonar out there and they do a complete... Uh, Bathymetric survey. Do it infrequent enough that like, there's usually some technology improvements 
right. that occur. So every survey that happens is a little better than the last. And um, I don't know if they do them in the same. It feels like Powell's is newer than me. Yeah, Powell's was updated so more recently. And, and I think Reformation does have a response time. Yeah, they they. Um, the, yeah, if you need to contact at Reclamation to get those, we can provide it. But they, they do go through that process uh, episodically. Um, it feels like every decade, right? Marcus pointed out that guidelines are elevation-based, not volume-based. So we'll take sand with water. We're not picky. We're not picky. That's right. So if you, have, if you can go put a boat or heavy people... Um, into Lake Powell sometime in August of next year, that would be helpful. <laughs> and I, we have heavy people, so, all right. Mr. McCann. It did for um, Powell. I, the, is this the, is this the upper, it's a, the delta, it's a, the yeah. Upper Right. So, you know, when you look at the pictures now, you can land survey a lot of the sediment that ended up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the drop path reports that you can land. Yeah. Yeah, if we can move it toward the dam, again, that would help with the elevation. <laughs> and you can do it in survey and it's, get off the water. All right. good ideas. Right, yeah, this is part of the creative process at CAP. Any, any other questions? Thank you so much. All right. All right. Before you go, Chuck, one thing. Thank you, by the way. Um, I just wanted to point out, Chuck and I have discussed um, both in the context of this meeting and I think um, we've shared at the board meeting a couple of times that one of the objectives of this of this meeting itself is to talk about the, the water supply outlook. And as we move towards shortage, um, particularly uh, within the CAP system, um, we'll, we'll try to have some meaningful conversations at this this meeting in the future about uh, what our outlook is for water supply and, and what will be available to contractors in the subsequent year, which is what I'm about to do now for 2019, but being likely a non-shortage year, as Chuck just reported. Um, it is not a non-shortage year. It is not a non-shortage year. It is not whatever. <laughs> that just threw me all off. So it, it's a normal year. Um, so I wanted to give a, this will this will be pretty pretty brief, but um, give just kind of an outlook about what what we're thinking in August of what the the delivery supply will be. Uh, there'll be a couple of key pieces of information, and then I'm glad to answer questions about that. But for what we're thinking for this year, so um, a little comparison to just the the CAP delivery supply that we're estimating for 2019 uh, compared to 2018, if that's a little helpful. Um, we're estimating uh, 1.67 uh, off the river. Um, that's a CAP estimate. That's that's something that um, um, we make here internally at CAP is both in terms of uh, what we think we're going to schedule for pumping and ultimately what we think will be unused by uh, higher priority users on the Colorado River. Um, we are not intending to take anything out of uh, storage in 20, uh, 2019. Um, we'll probably try to start uh, Lake Pleasant, start and end Lake Pleasant at the same, the same elevation, which is about that 1675. Um, there is there is an an interplay between those two numbers, and that's part of the reason I showed 2018 here in the walk down, um, because we were contributing a water from Pleasant. It was water we knew we had in the system. We were more bullish on our on our Colorado River estimate. Um, and, and I won't lie to you, um, I changed the 1.67 back to 1.66 and back to 1.67 about three times this morning um, before I gave, beside, and I think right now this is what, our, what, what we're sticking with. So, um, but that ultimately leaves, uh, once you take out the, the system delivery losses is a, a 1.595 million acre foot um, annual delivery supply, which is kind of everything, uh, meaning uh, it doesn't include some of the, the conservation programs that are not currently in place for 2019 yet, but are, and I'll walk that down here in just a minute. Um, uh, uh, for instance, 
Uh, no, I'll just I'll leave that for a moment. Um, but I did need to want to point out it is certainly significantly lower than what we were looking at for 2018. Um, we pulled a good chunk of water out of Pleasant. Overall, it's about 63,000 acre feet less. Um, again, more of a, a detailed breakdown about what that meant for the outlook for the delivery for for contractor deliveries. Again, we don't. Let me talk a little bit about the, the numbers. The 1595 I just explained. The 1174 right here that we're looking at is also an estimate of, of what we think you all will order um, here on October 1st. So um, that number came from, if you, if you recall, uh, we request uh, when we send out the letter and when the orders are submitted for not only the current year order, but also an outlook uh, if you'll provide it for the next two years. Um, and so this includes um, the outlook provided um, by you all in terms of what would be ordered in 2019 and 2020, um, unless you didn't provide us one, and then we made an assumption that it would be consistent with what you ordered in 2017. So um, shows a slight bump up in long-term contract orders from 2018 uh, to 2019 based on that estimate. Um, the subtraction of the supply from the, the long-term contract holders, holders represents the amount of excess water that will be available within the CDP system. Um, first priority of that excess is for the agricultural sediment pool. Uh, I'm showing 255,000 is our, our estimate that will be, again, ordered in 2019, which is essentially 300,000 less uh, Ag for Barons 3, which was the GSF uh, waiver for the district. So. No other reductions in the ag pool currently that I'm aware of for 2019. Um, that leaves about 166,000 of, of other excess. Um, of course, we won't know exactly what that volume is until we actually receive the orders uh, in October. Um, but certainly we thought we could try and uh, zero in on about what that volume is looking like for this year. Um, for comparative purposes, again, that's about 60,000 acre feet less um, than it was in uh, 2019, or in 2018. In 2018, um, about 100,000 of that was just direct other excess that went uh, to Lake, as a contribution to Lake Mead. Uh, the other 46,000 or 50,000 or so in that, in this 100, I'm talking about this 149,000 acre foot. Uh, volume right here, about 100,000 of that was just uh, excess CEP water. The rest was from the Ag for Barents programs. There were two of them in place, in, or there are two of them in place for 2018. Again, Ag for Barents 3 and Ag for Barents 4. Uh, and then the other water was, was uh, in 2018, was delivered as you see here. Um, I think the, the message that I, I'd like to leave here one of the messages we'd leave here with today is we're not thinking that there's going to be any water available for the statutory firming pool um, in 2018. So that would be uh, the water bank, uh, the replenishment reserve, and uh, uh, for reclamation for Indian firming. Um, the 166,000, when we know the volume, I think we'll still have some internal discussions. Today was the first day I saw the projections on Lake Mead in Chuck's presentation, so we'll still have some so I'm thinking about that to do and, and what the outlook looks like for conservation. Um, so before I leave this slide, there might be some questions. Greg. Oh, so, so the Lake Pleasant delivery, what exactly did that do for us in this year? Whereas you don't need it in 19, what pool did that work out? So a lot of that is right here, is really, if we hadn't made that water available out of the lake, um, that, that water wouldn't have been available for for essentially the statutory firming pool in the GRD. So is, is that gonna be a standard practice in the future? Um, of no Lake Pleasant? Of using Lake Pleasant to meet those, those needs. Um, so Lake Pleasant is just gonna be part of the delivery supply. So let me, let me back up a little bit. In 2018, um, the reason we made so much water out of Pleasant is because we had uh, a pretty good inflow come in on the Agua Fria, which wasn't, uh, didn't flow into CAP's account. It, it flowed into MWD's account, but it lifted ours towards the top. Um, 
I think we entered the lake at maybe 1684 or something uh, on January 1st. And the result of that is there's, there's limited space in the lake for pumping in the first quarter, which uh, affects our energy management. And so what I'm trying to say long-windedly, it was a little full, and we wanted to, to pull some water out so that we could manage our operations. It was, it was, it was really an operational decision. In 2019, we've got it out of there, and we were pretty bullish on our Colorado River um, estimation. That's still tracking. You know, we don't we don't have the final answer on that, um, and don't have super great clarity until November sort of time frame when we're doing the the actual AOP for the next year. Um, I did look at it, um, of course, before coming over here. I looked at it late last week. I would say between our, our estimate and what Reclamation is currently is projecting available on the river, there's about a 40,000 acre foot gap. Um, so uh, they're showing about 164, and uh, we're, we assumed 168. So you know, if that doesn't materialize, we'll, ha we'll have to take a look at, at where the lake's ending up and what our assumption is for, for this year. So did I answer your question, Greg? I, I talked a lot, but OK. It was operational for 2018. Um, I think our, our objective in 2019 is to hold it about where it is, which is what I'll call right down the middle of the fairway, not too full, not too empty. So, any other questions about Lake Lake Pleasant? Okay, or the or the water supply breakdown in general. Again, if I can just touch on that again, this will this will be kind of the same spot in the future. Um, if it's a if it's a shortage year, obviously that CEP delivery supply is going to be much lower, and we'll 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 have to spend some more time talking about how it how it impacts other other priority pools within the CEP system, and we'll try to have those discussions. And my objective is is to try and give you as as best of an estimate as we can uh, in August, because I know this is the time of year when when you all are making decisions about what the next year looks like and what your what water supplies you're going to have available for, for your um, operations and your objectives as well. So uh, that was one thing maybe Tom didn't talk about before is we used to hold this meeting when we had it. It was in November after we were kind of all done and, and we had the plan to present. But we, we have moved it forward and the, the idea is, is to try and, again, give you some picture about the water supply as we see it uh, and get some, get some discussion if it's needed uh, about that so going forward. So. Um, a graph of the same thing, just to sh kind of show where where this year falls relative to to recent history, um, both in terms of the long term contracts and and uh, we've kind of lightened up 2018 and 19. 2018's not in in the bag um, yet. Um, there's still still some water deliveries to occur and and uh, final accounting to occur. So. Again, this is just a real quick bullet list on, on some, some points I wanted to make about 2019. Again, I, th I think our message is we don't think there's going to be any statutory firming water. Uh, point out that this 2019, to, <laughs> to me, this is, tw 2019 is this year to me now. <laughs> to, October 1st used to be January 1st. But anyway, so next, in 2019, next year, uh, will be the last year that we have Navajo generating station, station available for, for power. Um, the only reason I think that's, a, that's important is um, in 2020, uh, we may both be looking at a uh, potential shortage year, so a smaller volume of water, and of course, uh, a slightly different uh, power acquisition strategy without Navajo generating station. Um, and so we, we've, we've got our eye on that, uh, and I'm not prepared to talk a lot about power today, but. Um, certainly, we want to have the system in a position so that we can uh, do what we need to do to ma manage our energy resources uh, uh, next year. We're also starting to get early indications about the actual day and time frame at which NGS will, will stop generating power. I don't think it's December 31st. Um, and then, of course, there's an, an ongoing DCP process. So. As, and, and maybe that's something I should have pointed out. We're, we're assuming that DCP for the operating plan uh, is not, not in place. Um, we've, we've backed down from our water supply from 2.8. Um, if DCP um, 
were in place, of course, that would be a reduction where we are in the, in the re a former, a mandatory reduction uh, where we are in the reservoirs right now. Um, so the assumption uh, still going forward 2019 is that uh, conservation or contributions to Lake Mead would still be on a, on a voluntary basis in 2019. So, uh, and of course those, those discussions are, are ongoing. So. Any questions about 2019 that I can field today? Please. So it, uh, it uh, does affect our operation at Lake Pleasant. And so how much water we, we may, may or may not make available out of the lake uh, will depend on how we want to shape our pumping uh, throughout the year. And that, that depends on our energy resource. So we, we take those into account. Brian? I think we could use a better understanding of how the higher priority water orders will come in and how flexible or not flexible they are so we can communicate that to our growers for planning you know so we'd like not to get jammed up against that but it is the potential of being pretty severe this year. so what i so i have a couple of thoughts on that brian and, and maybe it's time for us to to meet again um Right, right after the first of the year, I'm kind of thinking when we see what the scheduling looks like. Um, yeah, this year was a little surprising, and and because there is more uh, more water going to other higher priority users in the system, um, like the amount of the amount of uh, what I'll call peaking capacity that we have within CEP is is smaller. It, it's less, and so uh, we can go through that. I have some thoughts on the information we can we can share with you to try and um, at least have more awareness of, of, of what's actually available and what we can do. Um, we may even try and uh, work to um, well, be more purposeful in our scheduling, I'll put it that way, to try and uh, see if we can uh, help with the summer peaking issue as well. Other, other questions? All right, oh, that's, that means I'm done, sort of. So I'm going to turn it over to, to, to Phil. Is it Phil or Scott? Phil. Phil. And Phil's going to talk a little bit about uh, Salt River Siphon. All right. Hello, my name is Phil Pagels. I'm the project manager for the uh, Salt River Siphon project. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the project, where we've been, where we're going. It's kind of divided up into three different sections, 2017, 2018, and 2019. Um, the picture you see here is actually from Agua Fria Siphon. We did a dewater last week, and so we climbed in. You can kind of see the magnitude of the siphon um, in relation to the inspectors that are in it. So in 2017, uh, there was a focus group that Patrick put on that really was uh, structured to identify a period in 2019, even 2020, where we can get inside the Salt River Siphon to, to do repairs that, that were needed. And so I, I pulled a couple of slides that give everybody a little bit of background on what that, what that uh, presentation was about, provide a little bit of information for those that weren't able to attend. So in relationship to where we are today in CAP headquarters, Salt River Siphon is kind of sandwiched between the Beeline Highway and the Bush Highway. Um, it's right next to uh, Granite Reef Dam. So you can kind of get a little perspective of where it is in relation to the valley. Some fun facts. It's a 21 foot diameter siphon, 8,700 feet long. Steel construction, um, Agua Fria siphon is also steel construction. Uh, as Patrick mentioned, there's an abandoned siphon adjacent, so this was a replacement. Their original coating was coal tar epoxy, and then we did a DeVoe 238 uh, repairs in 2001. <clears throat> Excuse me, and you can see 70% of water deliveries flow through the siphon, so it's critical infrastructure. This uh, cartoon here kind of illustrates the, how the siphon undulates throughout its alignment. Far left-hand side is the inlet, where it transitions from an open channel to a siphon. And then it goes to what we call shallow well. It's a short dip um, 
right after the inlet, a manhole, deep well, obviously, because it's the deepest part of the siphon, uh, and then the evacuation structure, which is used to dewater the siphon, its primary means to dewater. Another manhole, and then the outlet where it transfers from, the, from a, a, a siphon, steel pipe, into an open channel. And Patrick and I were looking at this, thought it'd be just as a relative term, 70 feet from the, the top of the vault to the invert of the siphon. So it's, it's relatively deep, and this is, this is actually inside the, uh, within the, the river, the river bottom. So 2001, it was all hands on deck for CAP. Um, it was an internal project. Um, we did everything. We dewatered, we repaired. Um, so this gentleman that's on the scaffold is 20 feet, 21 feet up in the air, uh, hand applied um, on all joints. And spot repair, we did a full, uh, a full recode on the outlet section, 10 foot section on the outlet. And this is, in 2009, we did a partial blow off. So we evacuated the siphon. We didn't pump out any residual water. And you can kind of see you know, what, what, what the current condition was, or the condition at the time in 2009, which essentially all welds were exposed. Um, so we're anticipating the same level. I don't think it got any better. So we'll be expecting this maybe a little bit, little bit worse. Totally yeah. <laughs> and so 2018, I don't know if we talked about this at the focus group in 2017, but We've, since then, we've hired uh, a design build contractor, Aiken Gardner, partnering with Hartman Walsh and, uh, and HDR. And one of the first things they asked was, are you guys gonna do an inspection? We said, no, we're just gonna go in there and, and repair. They said, we need to be able to assess, prioritize repairs um, before we get in there in 19. So identifying a three-day, work with Patrick and his team to identify a three-day outage where we can get inside the siphon and really sort of assess what, what needs to be repaired make the best of the six weeks we possibly can. So don't have a lot of information of the Salt River because we haven't been in there since 2009 and we really don't have any information since 2001. So I pulled some pictures um, and you'll, this, is, this is all from 2001, but it kind of illustrates the three-day outage that we are anticipating. So day one, we're gonna dewater. This is the evacuation structure. I highlighted its location from the, the cartoon. It's capable of dewatering at 3000 CFS, but we won't nearly be dewatering at that, at that volume. 5% um, is, is what will be 5% of the, the allowable flow, so 150 CFS. It'll take about four hours to dewater about 70 to 80% of the siphon. And then we do, we pump. We throw pumps in shallow and deep well, and we pump out the residual water, uh, about one and a half million gallons in shallow well and five million gallons in deep well. Shallow well takes about eight hours, and deep well takes about 20. So total dewater time is about 28 to 30 hours. It's 24 hour operation, we're, all, we're always going. Work. And then this is picture of fish. Um, so, just gotta make sure I get this one. Grass carp, striped bass, and catfish are the three species that we anticipate. And we had 12 guys in 2001 working about six hours to remove fish from the, um, from the invert of the siphon from underneath the Salt River. So buckets, you know, 50 gallon buckets raised up. So it was quite the effort. Day two is the inspection, so we set a bulkhead uh, on the inlet side, and we install a 44,000 CFM fan to provide ventilation. It just helps with all the humidity that's in the pipe, and so you can better see the siphon. And then we do visual inspection. Um, we do dry film thickness, UT, and then we do what's called an EIS. It helps predict the life expectancy, remaining life expectancy of the coating. Um, this is provided by the Bureau. Bureau Reclamation will help us with this. And then day three, so the EIS is a two-day test. You walk in, you do the three cups, fill it with water, you come back and you do the test. So on day three, we'll get the, we'll get the results and then water back up. It's about a four-hour four hour water um, to, to refill the siphon. And you do that at about 3, 300 CFS as well. So that will bring us to 2019. There, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. So 2018, I just want to point out uh, that uh, we scheduled that um, during, well, uh, already, it's right in the middle of when the fall outage occurred and the tree fell after that. So all those years are, are offline. John, correct, help me, but we've, we've talked to, we reached out to SRP, uh, Mesa, and Roosevelt. Roosevelt. So those, those folks know that it's coming. Um, most everybody else, if we haven't talked to, we're, we're hoping we can continue to supply you water on canal storage just for that three-day duration while they're doing that, that inspection. So, so that's all. We'll be 
the short duration, limited interruption, I'm hoping, um, for those guys to get in there and help out that way. And then the, the Tucson folks will be offline already. And so, We'll, in 2019, we'll assess, uh, so we'll get a report back from the Bureau. We'll, um, we'll evaluate to see what the current condition of the siphon is. We'll start working with our designer to identify coatings, and then we'll start preparing a plan for that six week and identify certain areas that needed to be, um, needed to be addressed. And that time frame for the 2019 inspection, or 2019 repairs, is October 30th through December 10th, and six week outage, be 24 seven um, operation. So just provide a little uh, timeline where we started. We did a focus group uh, in, in February 2017. I think Patrick and his team published the final dates for the outage in September of 17, planning the, the assessment inspection this October, or this November, excuse me. Um, we'll have final product selection, final plan by uh, May of 19, and then this, the six week inspection in October and December. I wish I had more. I've got a little video, so that that'll be interesting. Probably more interesting than this, but um, I'll show you. I'll show you the the video. But uh, here's my contact information. Patrick and his team put. Um, I hope it goes to it. If it doesn't, that's okay. But this website has all the information since we met in, in beginning of 17. If you can't remember this link, just Google Salt River Siphon Outage, and it's the first one that pops up in your in your search bar. We'll, we'll post the video. Post the video. Okay. Do you not want to show? Do you want to show the video? No. Okay. Okay. It's pretty good. I mean, you can start. No. <laughs> okay. Any any questions? Yeah. How in that the shutdown period from October 30th to December 10th? How much extra? What can go wrong? Time have you got planned in, into that where it might there might be the opportunity to shorten that? What can go wrong? In other words, if you have an extra week, <laughs> oh. you have an extra five days planned oh. in there in case you've got extra work. Brian's asking if you can have your flow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we don't, so I, I, we have six weeks and we're going to plan to do the best we can. We don't, we don't know the current conditions, so we really don't have a quite plan. But six weeks is what Patrick said. He said, you have six weeks, no, not, not a day. Yeah. Six weeks is firm and you hope for better. Hope for better, yeah. Would it be beneficial if we got together again, maybe summer, uh, summer 2019 to talk about? Can we? Can it helps us do the early summer. Maybe what we'll propose is maybe we'll do another, we'll do an open meeting. Like, uh, Phil by then should have like a big meeting. Anybody who wants to come, Phil will have a scope nailed down by, you know, we'll call it May uh, next year. Yeah. Um, and then, so we'll maybe give a presentation, an update on what the work's going to be. Um, some of you have asked for tours and different things. We're, we've been thinking about that as well. So maybe some, we can really fine tune the details on the project. Uh, and then maybe after that, a smaller group of us that maybe SRP could, could meet with us and, and those that are going to be uh, really, that we have some tighter coordination. I think we can meet some nights on uh, Gilbert Chandler. And we'll, and we'll do that following that meeting uh, to get things uh, tuned up for what we'll do operationally. Yeah. Brian? The, the other operational thing is that I know you will have storage available for ag delivery during, during that time. Um, have you guys, and, and maybe it won't be till the main time frame, but the sooner we could get an understanding of maybe how, many, how much acre feet might be available for ag delivery during that time frame and at what, 
flow rates. You know, I know you'll have a decline in flow rates just to give us additional planning tool because we've already notified our growers that we're going to have that outage. And we said very little CAP available. You know, we might want to say none, and then if we have some, but but still, the degree to which you can give us that information in advance would be very helpful. No, you're right, Brian. I said, we posted it, well, how much is there online, and then I said, we'll build that out later. Yeah. Uh, so later we'll come, and yeah, we'll, we'll make the decision. I, when would you like to know that, Brian? Do you want us to do it in January? Do you want it right now? Uh, November of this year. If, you, if you've got a preliminary idea of how it might, might work, just for background, but sooner is always better. Yeah, we can we can look at after we get that annual operating plan done in November. We could probably look at that. Okay. And, and then uh, we might ask one or probably twenty. We might just directly ask what, how little can you get by with, and and then uh, take all those and see if we have that much. Okay. And then uh, if we have that and more, then we'll we'll go back yeah. to uh, we'll we'll do that after. Thank you. Any other questions about the solid recycling out? It's, it's, a, it's a big effort internally. It's a big project. We're really, we're really grateful to have Phil as our project manager on this. We're uh, grateful for the customer engagement too. I think we're, we've got a long lead time. Um, hopefully it's speaking to those plans and makes it through. Um, one of the downsides to a long lead time is you forget your coordinator um, when a year or two goes by and you have to remember what you what your plan for. Too, but it's, it's still coming and we're, we're still working. Me. Sure. So while, while we're getting Scott's presentation up, you go ahead and pull it up. I'm just going to talk a minute. Just a, a quick update on the, the water quality task force. So we're we're still uh, the water quality task force is a board task force that was put together to uh, develop water quality standards for the importation of non-project water into the CAP system. Um, that work is still ongoing. There were some some key constituents that were identified and reported out by the task force in June. And uh, CAP is, is continuing to work with uh, uh, stakeholders, including mostly the downstream cities. <coughs> it would be all of them, mostly the cities, um, to, to further flesh out the criteria that we need to have. So, just want to let folks know that work is be ongoing. The task force still has work to do, and that that will be uh, uh, ongoing through the through the next year. Go ahead, Scott. Okay. Good morning. Um, Thanks, Patrick, and, and as you mentioned, my name's Scott Bryan. I'm CAP Senior Biologist. Um, today, just kind of want to give an overview of, of some of the biological things that we're dealing with uh, on the CAP or what we've dealt with this past year and, and some of the things we're uh, looking forward to uh, in, the, in the coming years, I guess. Um, just a quick overview on the screen of, of some of the things I'm responsible for, but basically I do a lot of monitoring and research out there on the canal and outside the canal. Um, and, and give management recommendations based on, on what I'm seeing out there. So a couple of the bigger things that, uh, that we've dealt with in, in 2018, um, the billium slushing flow, Patrick mentioned it earlier, happened uh, back in March. A little controversial at the time. Um, some folks thought there was going to be no impact at all to Lake Havasu and, and then CAP's um, uh, intakes and, and water delivery. Um, we were a little bit concerned about it, as were some of you, uh, what might happen with turbidity and some of the water quality issues that come along with the flushing flow. Um, so I was out there for 10 days in, in March, uh, monitoring water, water quality, um, just kind of keeping an eye on things, getting an overview of, of what exactly was happening with this flushing flow so that we could be proactive in, and, uh, in our approach to, to how we're delivering water at that time um, to you folks. Um, despite what some people thought was going to happen, uh, we did get a, a big slug of turbidity come into the lake um, with, that, um, with that flushing flow. Um, about 24 hours after they hit the peak of the flow is when we saw it at Lake Havasu. Uh, turbidity's hit a little over 700 NTU. 
uh, during that time. So it's pretty thick mud. Um, shut down my motor on my boat several times, getting clogged up with um, not debris, but just just silt that was uh, that was in the water. So it was pretty thick. Um, with that initial slug of water that came through, a lot of debris was pushed through as well. Uh, so down in that southern end of the lake, there was a lot of floating logs, a lot of cattails that had been dislodged. Uh, everything that had come down that uh, that section of river uh, was making it into uh, into the lake. Uh, so as you can see from those pictures, pretty pretty muddy water. Uh, these are kind of a progression of how it how it worked around to the CAP. Um, our intake uh, it, there at Mark Wilmer's on the bottom of the screen. Uh, the uh, jetty, which was originally built to protect us from some of those sediments, uh, is through the middle of the screen. So on the left is our intake channel, on the right is where the Bill Williams comes in. Um, first day that uh, that the sediment plume came in, kind of followed the line of the the jetty there. Uh, that's where the, our primary flows are. So at that point, we were still flowing water. But we we're seeing turbidities on the, on the Bill Williams side. Um, again, 700 near where the confluence is, uh, around two to 300 where, um, you know, kind of out in the open water. Um, right there at the jetty, we we're in the, in the mid 50s. And um, as you come into the intake channel, we we're at about 14 to 20. So we made a decision that we were gonna pump for a little while longer, but then, then shut down the pump so we weren't sending that nasty water down to, uh, down to the users. Um, in the right-hand corner, that's the next day, you can see the, the turbidity is pretty much spread out. It's pretty even throughout the uh, intake channel in the Bill Williams. Uh, turbidity is in the 20 to 30 range. Uh, still pretty high to be pumping, so we, we uh, ended up having the pumps off for about five days. Um, lower left corner, Starting to clear out a little bit on day three. Um, day four in the lower right corner is clearing out even more. And, and by day five, we're down in that eight to 14 range where we felt we could start pumping again. So we can see it, uh, it, it did have a pretty big impact on us. Um, it, it was a pretty interesting event. Got to, got to fly the whole thing in a helicopter and, and see how much that whole area was flooded. Planet Ranch was, was completely underwater. Um, it, was, um, it was quite an event. And, uh, um, it, it did have an impact on CAP. So. Um, where they're at now with it, the, the goal of the flushing flow was to pretty much move sediments off of the sill, which holds the, uh, the bulkhead gate. Uh, they hadn't, hadn't done this since the 90s, and, and uh, they, they thought there was a lot of sediment down there. Um, so they finally got in there in early July to check out the sill and see if they could set the bulkhead gate. They got down there, and they had removed all the sediments or a majority of them anyway. Um, so the flushing flow was pretty successful in that manner. Uh, the sill, the concrete was a little bit cracked, a little bit of damage to it, but they didn't feel it was anything that was um, gonna stop them from, from setting the bulkhead gate and doing the inspection. Um, so they've set the, the bulkhead gate and getting ready to go down there and they did some water quality before they went down. Found the hydrogen sulfide levels are too high for them to, to get anybody down there and do any work. So they've, uh, the last few weeks, they've done a couple of additional flushing flows that last about an hour or so. They get about 1,000 CFS, trying to move out the, uh, the sediments that are causing the, the hydrogen sulfide and trying to just clear things out. Um, they haven't been successful, so their, their plan now is to kind of play the waiting game. Um, when, when things settle down a little bit, water gets uh, cooler, hopefully they can go in there later in the year to do the actual inspection. One of the other things we deal with out at uh, Mark Wilmer is the aquatic vegetation. Uh, since 2010, we've had a, a, a boom in or explosion in aquatic vegetation out in Lake Havasu. Kind of coincides with when the quagga mussels came in, so the clarification of the water, sunlight penetrates deeper, you get a lot more vegetation growth. Every year since 2010, uh, actually since 2012, we've been mapping the, um, uh, the intake channels. We're seeing more and more vegetation growth out there. The vegetation grows, it dies, floats to the surface, and then gets sucked to our uh, pumps. So it has the potential to, to really cause some issues out there by uh, uh, shutting down our water flow. Uh, so we deal with that in a, in a number of ways. Uh, a couple years ago, 2016, um, we put in a trash rake system to handle some of those bigger mats that come in. Um, 
the mat that you see there is uh, it's fairly large and it goes down to about 20 to 24 feet. So it's, uh, it's a very dense mat. And uh, what we didn't anticipate is the rake system that we put in can't handle mats that are, are that big. Um, and as you look at that picture, you can see the, rack is, uh, the rake is off its track there. So, um, so we're working on some modifications out there, uh, getting something in there that can handle those larger mats. Um, upper right corner, you see uh, some, some herbicide treatment. Uh, we we put, um, put that out there. We've done it three times now to try to minimize the growth that we're seeing in that intake channel. Had some mixed results with it. Uh, we didn't do it in 2017, and we're seeing our biggest year of, of weed growth that we've seen out there since. So it, it, it probably has had some effect. Um, so in subsequent years, 2019 and, and beyond, we're probably going to be looking at either using a different herbicide or, or multiple treatments, something that, uh, that, that might give us some better results. Uh, so for now, lower right corner there, that's our uh, weed collection, weed harvesting boat. Um, we got that man 24 seven, we're out there collecting uh, weed mats as soon as they come in and, and trying to keep everything clear so we can keep the water moving. Um, got a new boat, a uh, new weed boat coming that's bigger and faster and can handle big, more weeds. Um, unfortunately, it didn't come in for this weed season, but we'll have it ready for, um, for next season. Typically, the season uh, starts in uh, second week of July, July 8th, I think, is the average start date where we see those mats starting to come in and uh, typically done by the end of September. So uh, we've got another, another month of, of weeds. Um, it it kind of comes in two stages. The weeds that grow within our intake channel usually hit us in the early season, and the weeds that come around from the Bill Williams, and they have a, lo a lot of growth over in the Bill Williams uh, Wildlife Refuge. Uh, monsoons will bring those around in, in August and September, so um, we're, we're kind of in the midst of, of those weeds hitting us now. Um, vegetation in the canal, this is uh, the root aqua rooted aquatic vegetation. We really haven't seen any problems at all in recent years. Um, we're stocking it heavily with grass carp, and they're doing a great job of keeping the, the rooted vegetation away. I think um, uh, one year down in south Tucson, we had uh, south of Tucson, we, we had some pretty significant vegetation growth. Uh, in, in, uh, uh, we were able to take care of that, but other than that, the, the grass carp are, are doing their job out there and, and uh, we don't see any rooted vegetation growth. Uh, filamentous algae in the canal, um, we do see that from time to time, but it never really grows to a point where it's reaching the surface or causing any kind of issues. Um, the grass carp don't prefer to eat the algae, uh, but they will if there's nothing else out there. So as long as they're keeping, keeping on top of the rooted vegetation, they're gonna, gonna turn their attention to the algae and, and they've been doing a pretty good job of keeping that down. So we really, really haven't seen any problems with the, uh, with the filamentous algae. Quagga mussels, um, they're the, uh, uh, I guess, the bane of my existence. <laughs> um, they're, they're, they're here and they're here to stay. They cause us problems in some areas and not problems in others. Um, in the canal itself, we really don't see a lot of issues. Uh, it's mainly the issues are related to the, the pumping plants and the turnouts. Um, this year we're doing a lot of turnout work, so I was able to get in there and, and take some photos and see what kind of infestations we had um, in, the, in the turnouts. Uh, this particular one is uh, Glendale turnout. And you can see quite a few quaggas in there, but it, it wouldn't really be classified as a heavy infestation. There are a lot of big individuals, but there's a lot of exposed concrete as well. Uh, sometimes when you're out at, uh, or sometimes you see pictures of like uh, Hoover Dam or, or Parker Dam, and you see uh, you know, several inches worth of quaggas on there. Uh, we don't have that kind of infestation so far that I've seen in our turnouts. Um, the bottom looks a lot worse than it, than it probably is. That's a lot of shell debris. Um, and it's primarily Asian clams rather than just quagga mussels. So it's a combination of the two. Um, haven't heard a lot of uh, issues that, that you folks are having in the turnouts with the quagga mussels. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to say there's no impact, but it's, it's been fairly minimal um, to date. Uh, like I said, out at the pumping plant's a little bit different, uh, especially the Mark Wilmer pumping plant where the quaggas are, are teaming up with kind of a new invasive species. Uh, it's just been in the last several years that uh, 
that Lake Havasu has been more infested with a colonial hydroid, uh, which is actually an animal, it's not a plant. Um, but they, they team up together in our surface air coolers out there in, in the upper uh, left-hand corner. You see how they, they, they grow in those coolers and then they start trapping sediments and, and clogging, the, um, uh, clogging the pipes in, in the, the uh, cooling water units there. So we can't keep the, the units cool and we get uh, overheating and tripping of the, um, of the coolers. Um, the, the lower left there is the hydroids that grow right on the trash racks. So you can see they, they make them pretty furry, um, but they don't seem to cause a lot of issue of us drawing water in. Uh, we can get water past them. They don't grow to that point. Um, so they don't cause us real issues in, in that manner, just in those cooling units. Uh, on the right-hand side there is our raw water intakes. Um, we've had problems with those with quaggas infesting those intakes and, and making it difficult to bring in our service water to our pumping plants. Um, we've coated them with a, uh, a foul release coating that we started about three years ago and it's been working great. It's keeping the, uh, keeping the quaggas off of it. So, uh, back to the, the surface air coolers, uh, really expensive to take those things apart, have to clean them out, you know, every year, every two years. So we started a pilot program in 2016 to, to treat the, uh, cooling water with a copper sulfate product, um, uh, it's known as Earth Tech. I think several of you are looking at that to put in your own turnouts uh, to try to control quagga mussels. Uh, we've had great success with it. We did that pilot study in, in 2016. Um, we're actually continuing the treatment of, of one unit out there. Uh, so we've been going for two years now. On the left-hand side, you can see that that's a unit that hasn't been treated uh, after about six months of growth. A lot of hydroids in there. It's starting to uh, block some of those, uh, uh, some of the cooling units, and um, create the uh, create a heating of the of the motors themselves. On the right hand side, it's the same time frame uh, with the Earth Tech. It's been uh, it's been a slow drip system into the cooling water system for that same time period, and uh, we have no growth at all. And that's exactly the way it looks today, two years later. So we've. Um, uh, we've been really happy with, with the way that's performing, and we're looking into expanding that to all six units out at Mark Wilmer and, and um, other pumping plants if necessary. Uh, sediments, um, we have a lot of sources of sediment, whether it's blown in from some of these dust storms, um, just general drainage around the, uh, around the canal itself. We have a lot of sediment that comes in the system. Uh, typically does not affect us operationally. We can move the water we need to move without any issues, um, but it does take up some capacity. Uh, this year we took apart some, uh, some of the raw water units in uh, some of the southern plants, and we're pretty surprised to see in that left picture there that they're, they're just packed with sediment and organic debris in there. Um, on the right-hand side, that's the Santa Rosa turnout, and our turnouts down south, we get uh, pretty heavy sedimentation down there. And whenever we do have any uh, operational limitations with that, we, we go ahead and, and get mechanical equipment out there and, and dredge it. And uh, save the best for last here, our, um, our Simbella issue. Um, we, we affectionately call it rock snot. Rock snot's typically uh, what they refer to as a, a species called Didymo. Simbella is a close cousin of it. It's a it's the same stock diatom type species. Um, Give you a microscopic picture of that. It's a single-celled algae, a diatom. Uh, it's it's a pretty interesting uh, organism. It it um, works the opposite of the way most algae would work. It it grows these stalks when there's low phosphorus, not high phosphorus. So when you have high phosphorus in the water, the cells the diatoms divide. The cells divide, um, and you, they never grow these stalks. But as soon as they get low phosphorus uh, conditions along with uh, kind of low steady flows, uh, high sunlight, um, in, in high temperatures, uh, they start growing these stalks and, and they'll attach to the bottom of the canal and that's where we, um, uh, we start seeing some issues. That picture on the lower right is, is kind of how they've attached to the, the liner of the canal. Um, they live for a few months and uh, then they eventually die. The, the stalks actually outlive the, the organism itself, but um, when, it, when it all of it dies, and, and whether it's flows that, that pull these up or, or it's just the dead organism, 
they eventually float to the surface. Um, I know several of you have seen uh, this floating debris in the canal. Um, and it kind of congregates into our pumping plant areas where we get large mats of it. Um, doesn't affect uh, our pumping plants much. It, everything passes through pretty easily. But where we see the most growth is, is in Waddell Canal and in, um, in Pool Baus. And both of those, the thing those two, two portions of the canal have in common um, are the relatively slow, steady flows. Uh, so it, you know, not a lot is known about this organism. There hasn't been a lot of research. There's not a lot of literature out there. Um, so we're, we're learning as we go, I guess. And that's one of the things we've noticed is that um, uh, these low, low steady flow uh, conditions are, are where it seems to thrive. Um, they've tried different treatments on it. They've tried copper sulfate, uh, several other chemicals. The copper sulfate is, is probably the most effective, but to say it's effective would be stretching it. It doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't have a good, uh, it's not very effective in, in killing it at all. So, um, uh, so there, there's still a lot of studies being done to, to find out more about it. Um, that picture kind of shows you a, a, a good indication of why it's called rock snot. Um, it, uh, those, those diatoms uh, grow those stalks and then the stalks intertwine and it's a, it's a polysaccharide uh, type substance and it just creates that, that slimy mess, I guess you'd call it. Um, the issues that we have had here at CAP with the, um, with the rocks not are, are more related to the ability to, to move water than they are uh, you know, having any problems with clogged strainers or, or filtration systems. Um, unfortunately, we get the biggest problems with the Cymbella, with the, with the rocks not, uh, when you guys need the water most. So we're trying to push as much water as possible. When this stuff grows on the, uh, on the canal liner, it causes friction, water slows down, and we can't get you guys the water you need. Um, so really, our only defense against this is to, is to go ahead and scrape those sections of canal where we're seeing uh, issues um, with, with, uh, with Cymbella and with the flows. Um, so that's a, a custom scraper on the end of that great all. It's a pretty laborious process to get out there and, and scrape any section of canal. You can do about 20 feet at a time. and, and uh, and you have to you know, keep crawling down the canal and, and uh, cleaning the next section. So, so that's kind of a general overview of, uh, of the big things we've been dealing with, uh, biologically anyway, in the, um, in the CAP this, this season. Any questions? No? Mm -hmm. So I know Scott showed us doing some scraping in the Waddell Canal. You know, things <laughs> things always happen a little differently than you plan. So um, this year, like Scott said, we we uh, we had issues in pool bows, which I didn't know about until today, and then uh, in the Waddell Canal. And so we did do a little bit of scraping uh, last week and, and scraped up the Waddell to get rid of the the rock snot. Typically in August, we don't have a capacity issue in the Waddell Canal. Um, we did this year because of high demand and because um, uh, we had the Haciampa outage. So it was a bit of a bit of a one-off, bit of a perfect storm this year. Uh, we went to full releases from the lake. We tried to get 3,200, maybe a little more uh, CFS to come from the dam uh, into the, the greater Phoenix service area. We were about uh, 200, 150, 200 CFS short of that. Uh, and decided to go out there and do some scraping. That doesn't happen uh, really every year. In fact, I, the last year I remember us going to full releases from the dam like that. It may have been at least 10 years or so ago. So, you know, in 2016 when we said, oh yeah, August 2018, that'll be a perfect time to do that Sun Valley tie-in. Load will be low and we won't have these issues. And when it actually came to the, the day we did it, it wasn't ideally timed. But uh, we, didn't, we didn't make it did make it through. So um, I'm going to do a little setup for Marcus. I know I'd, I'd hope to be done by 1030. We'll, we'll try and finish up in 10 minutes or so, I think. Um, but I did want to I did want to share this and it and need, and needs a little backstory. So for those of you who uh, remember working with Jody Gould, Jody, Jody retired in 2011, which is some time ago now. It seems like 
uh, just yesterday, but it's you know six or seven years ago, um, or eight or seven. Um, Jody, um, I believe she accounted every acre foot delivered from 1985 to to 2011. Um, and, and Jody, uh, that water accounting process uh, evolved over that nearly 30 year time span. Um, in, in my department, she was always a little famous for Jody's ledgers where she recorded the, the water deliveries on. They were, they were three ring pinders um, that had uh, different colored paper for the different classifications of water uh, that were used. Um, we've scanned those, we still have them. I don't know if we have them in color um, like she had, but um, the bottom line was it was, it was a, a paper process uh, for, for a lot of years. Um, and over the last, last few years, we've been working um, to move that to an electronic process, to a database process, um, for a few reasons. Uh, one, one, we need to get with the times. I, I don't mind pointing back at Ken and saying there was an impetus there from a, a planning perspective. Uh, the way we were keeping our data wasn't meeting our needs for some of the other work we wanted to do. Um, and some of our reporting, even, even now as we move through uh, a lot of the DCP and other discussions we've had over the last 24 months, I think there's a, a greater desire for data. So um, it's still still an ongoing process, if you will, but I believe we're at a point where we're, we're thinking we might have um, a little different reporting capabilities that are going to be available uh, publicly on the CEP water deliveries. Um, and we have some other ideas and things that we want to, to bring, bring forward um, over the next few years. Um, but as a first step, I, I think probably most of you are, are familiar with our, our, our water delivery reports. I think on the website we have going back to 99 uh, in kind of the same format. Um, and Marcus has a couple of new, new reports that he's gonna share with you today. Um, and I think we're gonna, our plan is to do these, we're gonna kind of post them at least for a little while. I'll let you talk about it, but in, in beta, but this is a, um, the backstory, our attempt at uh, modernizing our reporting and making our water delivery data a little uh, easier to understand um, and share. So uh, with that, Marcus is gonna go through the couple of the reports real quick. So I figured uh, that we'd start and just bring up the old and the new and talk a little bit about that. Uh, and recognize, kind of like Patrick was just mentioning, that this has been a process that's been ongoing for years, at least internally here at CAP, and did uh, begin mm -hmm. essentially with uh, the planning and has since evolved into a number of people involved across departments from our uh, IT department to our finance department uh, and our resource planning and analysis department as we work together to be able to get the data in a format that's uh, hopefully more usable for everyone. Uh, so on the top here, uh, this is the existing report uh, that is published on the CAP website that shows the deliveries. You can see that it starts here with uh, monthly m &I deliveries. And uh, as you scroll through, uh, one thing that you'll notice is that the deliveries are also specified uh, and called out by recharge facility in this report. As you move through the report, uh, you will come down and notice that after you finish the subcontract, category, you'll have a little subtotal, and then you start to hit an M&I excess category, uh, then a temporary use category, ag excess, ag settlement pool, and then federal on and off reservation. So that's uh, currently what the report looks like. Uh, for comparative purposes, we can walk through some of the new reports that we'd like to put out on the website and, uh, and see uh, if those facilitate and are helpful uh, to all of you. We have received a little bit of feedback as part of the Excess Water Task Force. This happened to, uh, we, we had been working on this for years, but as the Excess Water Task Force came along, uh, it proved to be an opportune time as there was a desire for more reporting that we might be able to provide some of this reporting. So we did have the opportunity to sit down with AMWA, um, representatives from AMWA and EDF and some others to get a little bit of feedback uh, on some of these reports. And as Patrick mentioned, there'll be a work in progress that we might continue to, some of these may evolve a little. A few things to point out with the new reports down here. Uh, they've essentially been split into two reports now. 
So we have a monthly water delivery report, and now we also have a monthly delivery report by recharge facility. And so as part of that, uh, there are a few uh, differences in how the data is presented. Uh, the first part of this uh, report, there are two summary tables that will hopefully be helpful. Uh, the first is deliveries by contract type. And you can see that uh, it's called out. In, the, in this case, it's just essentially alphabetical order. Uh, excess water that is going to the ag settlement pool, other excess water, federal on and off reservation use, and MNI uh, subcontract use. And so you can see as well that uh, there's also now a new column for remaining. So you can see what's been scheduled uh, for the year as well as what's been delivered. In this case, we're looking through June of uh, 2018 and what's remaining to be delivered. And then we've taken and flipped that table. So there's another summary table that uh, is deliveries by priority. So that uh, breaks down and adds this column uh, into the table above that shows uh, the priority of water that has been delivered and is scheduled as well at the annual level uh, throughout the year. So you can see uh, that in the excess, other excess uh, category, we have excess water. We also this year are diverting uh, some excess interstate water, water which is uh, Nevada unused apportionment. You can see that noted in a footnote down here that will be stored in Arizona. Uh, to date, uh, those deliveries just began occurring in July. So you see that they're scheduled, but they have not occurred at this point. And that is water that was in addition to the excess water that was available as part of the CAP uh, supply. We're essentially the wheeler in this case, uh, moving the water uh, through the CAP system. Uh, then you've also, it gets a little more interesting too as you move down into the federal category. In the federal category, you'll notice that there is uh, NIA water, non-Indian agricultural priority water, uh, Indian priority water, and P3 priority water that makes up those federal contracts. And so you can see how that splits out across the federal contracts. And then at the bottom, uh, in the MNI subcontract category, uh, NIA and MNI uh, priority water both show up there. Uh, after you hit the uh, summary tables, then you'll move more into what's a little bit more familiar. So in this case, we're going to start with the excess uh, and uh, other excess category. And the primary differences here are that because we have split out the recharge uh, facility data into another report, everything's rolled up here, not by facility, but um, primarily just by these contract types. So you can see here in the excess, other excess, uh, the Arizona Water Banking Authority, uh, there's the interstate water as well as a water that's being delivered to each one of the three AMAs that are within the service area. Uh, we have CAGRD deliveries, some temporary users, and then uh, the Bureau of Reclamation. As you move down on the next page, uh, then we'll also hit the agricultural sediment uh, pool, and that's going to be rolled up again just by user. It looks pretty similar to what was in the old report in this case. And then as we move down into the federal uh, on reservation section, uh, we've split out and provided a little bit more information. So you can see here who the water user is. And in this case, the partner isn't too much different. It'll make more sense when we move into the off reservation. Uh, but in this case, uh, we have the auction uh, Indians using their federal uh, contract, federally contracted water, as well as the Gila River Indian community, Pasquiaki. And you can see what those uh, deliveries look like throughout the year. As you move into the off-reservation uh, section for federal water, once again you'll see the water user, but then there's also listed the partner and the type of agreement that has made uh, this delivery possible. So uh, in some cases you have the auction Indian community delivering their federally contracted water uh, to an off-reservation location, which is generally going to be a recharge facility or some type of uh, other location. Uh, APS uh, has an exchange agreement with the Gila River Indian community, and so, and this shows the deliveries that come under that exchange agreement. As you move down into Chandler, uh, you're going to see a number of agreements. 
So we have, and, and maybe we'll start up here, um, and these are all footnoted at the bottom of the table, but we have assignment water that is a Roosevelt, uh, that came originally from the Roosevelt Water Conservation District subcontract and was assigned to different cities. So that will show up here uh, by Chandler, and then Welton Mohawk water as well that came from the Cliff Dam replacement water that was assigned. And then Chandler also has an exchange with the Gila River Indian community, and there's also uh, SRPMIC, which is the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community water that was uh, uh, essentially leased out to the different cities as well. So we've broken this apart. Uh, one difference between the old report is you'll notice up here, uh, and this is in the MNI, which is a little different, but you'll notice that if you wanted to find all the water by a specific water user, you had to look through the sections and find the different assignments, the different agreements, and where that came and piece that together. In this new report, at least by the federal contract or the MNI contract, uh, we have put that all together so that it all kind of shows up in one place. Um, you'll notice that's going to be similar as you move through all of the rest of uh, these categories, and it just kind of depends on the different users and what water is available to them. Uh, there are some notes to help you uh, see what's going on. And then as you move into the subcontract category, you'll notice that a lot of these agreements are just subcontracts. But there is, once again, as you move into some of the cities, assignment water. And, oh, this is the Cliff Dam replacement water. I misspoke earlier about confusing two of those together. Um, uh, what's been delivered to Chandler in terms of Cliff Dam replacement and then what's being delivered under their subcontract. And that pretty much sums up uh, where we're at right now in terms of the reporting. If you move over to the monthly deliveries report, so we pretty much in the, uh, in the, the first monthly delivery report, we took out all the recharge facility information and just rolled it up uh, essentially by the agreements. If you want to take a different view and look at just at recharge facilities. I just want to interrupt you for just a second. Yep. So in that, the, the report that's on the website now, when you go look at that, it, it shows everything. I mean, if you go to the total on the bottom, it'll show all the water scheduled within the CAP for that year and all the water that is actually delivered. So we're breaking that apart a little bit. But the first one that Marcus just got walk, just walked you through will still show all of the water delivered. So. I think that'll be important. These are, we're going to show different things. They're not additive. The first one's going to show all of the yeah. CP water delivered. And the second one is going to show that same water that's included in the, your first report delivered to specific recharge facilities. I wouldn't want somebody to look at it and say, hey, you guys delivered uh, you know, 2.2 million uh, uh, vehicle last year. So. So, sometimes we have, we try to figure out ways to make water, but this, we, we promise this is not one of them. <laughs> So um, that's an excellent point. So yeah, everything's contained here. As you move to the recharge facility report, uh, that is just focused on deliveries that were made to recharge facilities. And you're going to see first it's listed um, as GSF, or groundwater saving facility deliveries. And it's split first by AMA, and then a recharge facility. And then those uh, water users that have stored water uh, with that GSF facility, and those deliveries are then listed as well. And then similar to the other report, they're still delivered and scheduled and remaining uh, column here at the end. And so that'll give you kind of a sense. Um, here's uh, New Magma Irrigation and Drainage District, Queen Creek, uh, Roosevelt, SRP. Uh, Tonopah Irrigation District, and now we're moving down into Pinal AMA, uh, Katy, Hohokam, uh, Maricopa Stanfield, and then, of course, down to Tucson, uh, Asarco, BKW, BKW Mile Wide, and Cortero Marana, and Kai Red Rock. And then you can see the totals of uh, GSF deliveries that were made. Uh, then we switch over to USF deliveries, so underground storage facility deliveries, and this includes both CAP-owned facilities as well as other facilities uh, that deliveries are being made to that we are aware of. And so uh, we've got the Agua Fria recharge project, both the constructed and managed. 
And then SRP has uh, the GRESP facility, uh, Hieroglyphic Mountain, which is a CAP-owned facility, Superstition Mountain as well is a CAP facility, uh, Wetlands of Avondale, uh, the Gila River Indian Community, their uh, MAR-5 uh, storage facility, Aver Valley for Metro Water, and then CAVSARP uh, for Tucson, Lower Santa Cruz, uh, Pima Mine Road, and SAVSARP for Tucson. And so this gives a little bit of an overall view of what's happening in terms of recharge and water deliveries within the CAP system. Uh, this data is all, these reports are all being generated uh, from a database. Uh, there's been a lot of work there. And what we plan to do in the immediate uh, near future is uh, on our website where we post the monthly water delivery reports, we're gonna post both the old and the new for the remainder of the year to give you a chance to take a look and use the data uh, and let us know how that's going. And then uh, we plan to transition, our hope and goal is to transition completely to new reporting uh, beginning with the new calendar year, so in January 2019. Any questions or comments about some of these reports? So one, one of the objectives, at least with the first report, I'm, I'm a little more hopeful that, um, so some of the questions, some of the reporting we've organized are, are based on questions that, that we've received over the years. Um, with regard to the, the first monthly delivery report, we, we did have a desire to try and create some sort of, almost a one-to-one -one connection that if someone pulled up our MNI or our, our, our CAP subcontract the status report, it shows who has all the CAP contracts and where their volumes are. But likewise, they could they could go over and look at their <coughs> delivery report and you know you have these contracts and these volumes. Here's how that water is being taken over those contracts. I think this is easier to do that way. So so certainly for the, the novice who's researching CEP deliveries, I, I think there'll be some some benefit there. Uh, we do get a lot of questions about storage and, and consequently the recharge. Yeah. We we have other visions too. None of which I've talked with the IT manager about. Um, yet, and, and so I'm reluctant to commit to the customers that will deliver those without fully engaging an internal team. Um, but I think it's, it's a fundamental that uh, uh, once, now that we have it in a database, we, we have some more flexibility to create some other products and certainly have a desire to do that to try and make uh, the data available and easy to use. Um, Marcus may have been about to ask for comments. We, we're, we're glad to hear questions and comments. We're going to post those up, like Marcus said, uh, for the balance of the year. A couple of things about that. If there's something that we're reporting that you that you don't like, uh, we'd like to hear about that as well. Um, and I think this is also true. This is true. Where am I going to? We we've got the twenty. We don't have a plan right now to go backwards. Talked about it. Um, it, it. It's on the uh, it's on the planning table, but we don't have a schedule for implementation to migrate some of uh, old deliveries backward. It's yeah. going to be kind of a change at a point in time. And, and I guess maybe to add on to that, what what you have the reason that is is you have uh, an original. We have two versions of a database, and so we had to make some significant changes to the database and we're still uh, needing to migrate data that was in the original database, which is driving uh, the reporting uh, up above uh, that you're currently used to, and, and we still need to migrate that data. So through 2018, and yeah, we have through 2018 you will have uh, the, the old reports, and then 2019 going forward. Yep. D. Okay. Okay. We, we do. Yeah, we do have. For the for the recharge project. Yeah. Yeah, the cumulative. Just saying, I'm going to go off on a quick aside. I know it's in there, but we realized when we were doing this that uh, in April of this year, CAP crossed the 40 million acre foot delivery line. So we don't want to use that often.
questions on the recording? Uh, other questions for the team or Tom? Mm -hmm. Tom can do it tonight, not on my time. <laughs> One. Those are right under 1.6 million for the for the total block, and so the the delivery supply that we showed for this year was 1595. So I think the total block aligns aligns pretty well. So, and there will be some variability in it as we've as we've kind of shown in the past. Yeah, I guess it's just a reminder that the that, that the way those all lined up in there isn't always constant. There are changes from year to year. There are, there are some, some movement there. Yeah. Other, other questions? Did you have a comment? Okay, yeah. Maybe just one, one thing. Um, for the first time, really, I, our reporting, and Marcus has just shown, um, breaks things out by, by, by priority. And um, essentially, as many of you who have complex portfolios of CAP supplies, you send in your schedule for delivery by turnout by month and then essentially a preference order of filling your, your orders. As we get closer into shortage and how um, reductions affect priorities, we're, we're going to need, all of us are going to need a, um, a finer understanding of how you might order your water under a shortage uh, condition that may be different. Um, and I'll give a quick example. For the most part, um, the NIA priority CDR water is scheduled first. Um, there's some take or pay provisions, that's lower priority water, and then M&I is uh, often scheduled later. And, if, and we are in a reduction scenario where we're hitting into the NIA, folks might schedule that differently. So there are, when we start getting into the tens of thousands of acre feet, there are differences even between how folks are scheduling order, their orders now and how we might anticipate um, that block chart looking in an actual shortage condition. So part of what I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for on a planning analysis side is that as we together move forward towards a shortage condition, that we're chewing up some of the expectations on the scheduling, particularly the kind of the two year ahead scheduling and how that might align with priorities. Because as everybody now knows, priorities matter. That's one of the, you know, and that's discretionary to the schedule, right? Yeah, so we're, we're, CAP's not uh, mandating when order you, that's a, at the discretion of the contract. Other, other questions? Warren? Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for doing this. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Yes, thank you. We clap so we can close, I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> End it, end it right there. And, uh, so I appreciate uh, coming to Tom indicated. Uh, we, we certainly are striving to have uh, data available and a, and a good relationship with the water users. Work on the program. Glad to do this. Thank you.